Instagram.com. Okay, so welcome to part two of our EKG case. Now, we showed you this EKG that clearly shows ST segment elevation, and we have reviewed it methodically as we do in our EKG course at MegCram.com. But what we left for the end, of course, as part of our protocol that we go through is looking for ST segment changes. And we found significant ST segment changes, significant ST segment elevation in the precordial leads with reciprocal ST segment depression. This is highly concerning for a ST segment elevation MI. Now in our course, we go through differential diagnosis for ST segment elevation like pericarditis, et cetera. So beware of those distractors from a true ST segment elevation, myocardial infarction. So the question is, is what do we do? And this is a very specific case. This is not just a regular heart attack. That would be an end STEMI where you have an elevation in troponin and otherwise the patient doesn't have these signs. This is an emergency. This has to be dealt with very quickly and there are timings that are dealt with. The major thing that we look at in ST segment elevation or STEMI, STEMI, there's two possible things that you should consider in this. And the one is called PCI or percutaneous coronary intervention. Or the other one is TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. And what's going on here is we are trying to open up the coronary arteries. So which is it that you would choose? Well, there are different side effects. TPA is where you give a medication that dissolves all the blood clots in the body, and that could be highly risky, especially if someone's had a recent stroke or if they've had surgery recently. And so what you look at, all things being equal, is the amount of time it's going to take to get one of these two things done. And that one, in terms of PCI, is known as the door-to-balloon time. And for TPA, it's known as the door-to-needle time. So what they recommend, ideally, you should have no more than 90 minutes from door to balloon time. And if you can't get 90 minutes, then that is not an optimal situation. But the real cutoff that they use is actually 120 minutes. So if there's no contraindications for TPA and you can't get a patient to PCI, that means as soon as they see the ambulance, as soon as they come in the door, to when they get balloon time, if it's not going to be less than 120 minutes, then go to TPA. If it's going to be less than 120 minutes, then go ahead and do PCI. PCI is where they do coronary catheterization. They either use a balloon or a stent and they try to open up that coronary artery so that the patient can get reperfusion. 90 minutes is ideal, but really 120 minutes is the cutoff. The other question is, what are you supposed to be doing during this time? What medicines are you supposed to be giving? Sometimes that can be confusing. So let's talk about that. Okay, so the thing that we look at is Mona. Think about a patient moaning in pain when they come in. So this will get you started with what you need to do, but certainly it's not everything that you need to do. So the first thing is morphine. And that actually causes the pain to go down. It helps with sympathetics. And it can actually cause some vasodilation, which is helpful. O stands for oxygen. There's no real evidence that shows that normoxic patients with myocardial infarction benefit from oxygen. But we do it as a good thing anyway, especially if the patient's hypoxemic. The recommendations are anywhere between 2 and 3 liters, depending on the guidelines that you look at. Nitrates. We use sublingual nitroglycerin, so that's what the N stands for. And we can do that every three to five minutes. If this is helpful, the thing that you have to be aware of, though, is a couple of things. Number one, it can drop your blood pressure, and therefore it can prevent you from giving other medications further on down the list that are probably more important. So be aware of that. The other thing that you have to watch out for is if they're on phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors like sildenafil, etc., because that can cause some real problems with blood pressure. Probably the biggest one that you've got to know is A4 aspirin or ASA. And the initial dose is 162 to 325 milligrams. And they have to make sure that they chew it because we're looking for sublingual absorption. And then lifetime after that, then you're looking at 75 to 162 milligrams a day. So that's Mona. Now, that's not where it stops. There's other things that you do in a STEMI. This is for a STEMI or an ST segment elevation MI. The other thing that we look at are the thionopyridines. And you're like, what is that? Well, when I start giving you the medications in there, you'll start to understand who they are. So we're talking about Plavix, like clopidogrel. 
Another one that you might see is Ticagrelor. Another one is Ticlopidine and Pasurel. So Pasurel is the last one that we look at. These ones should not be given if you're going to be doing surgery. So contraindicated if surgery. So if you're going to cabbage, coronary artery bypass grafting, then these need to be stopped five to seven days prior to that. We rarely use ticlopidine because of the risk of TTP. Look that up. And we don't use Pasquarel if there is a history of stroke or TIA. But clopidogrel, etc., these are ones that also should be used. And we typically will continue these, especially if a stent has been placed for about 12 months. That's typically what we do. Okay, next on the list are the 2B, 3A inhibitors. These inhibit fibrinogen from binding. And some of the ones that you might see here, I'll list those here. These are medications that very strongly inhibit the ability uh, for fibrinogen to bind. You might know them as Integralin, etc. And these medications are used generally as a bridge to PCI, so be aware of those. The next one that we'll look at is full-out anticoagulation. And so what are we looking at? We're looking at unfractionated heparin, we're looking at low molecular weight heparin, and we're looking at things like bivalirudin, which we rarely use if we're going to be using a 2B3A inhibitor. Unfractionated heparin should be at least for 48 hours, low molecular for eight days, or until hospital discharge. The list keeps going though. Beta blockers. Or you can use a calcium channel blocker if they have a contraindication like asthma. So remember, don't use these if the patient has signs of heart failure or pulmonary edema. It's best used if they have angina because it can reduce the ability of uh, the amount of angina. Another one that you can use, ACE inhibitors or ARBs. And you would not start these while they're still in the hospital because it can cause problems with hypotension. So do it at discharge. Another one, since we're on the topic, are the aldosterone inhibitors. And the big one there is aplerinone. But you've got to be careful with aplerinone. It was used in patients with ACE inhibitors if the ejection fraction was less than 40%, if the creatinine was less than 2.5, and if the potassium was less than 5.0. Great. The other one that you need to be on is statins. And we're looking for an LDL reduction of greater than 50%. So we want a pretty large reduction in LDL. So statins, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, aldosterone, etc., And going back to Mona, nitrates, oxygen, morphine, aspirin, all of those medications we talked about should be going on as we are considering what we need to do for the patient with a STEMI. So take a look again at this EKG and you'll see what are all the signs and symptoms of a STEMI and know what there is to do next time a patient comes in to the emergency room and presents with those symptoms and this EKG. Thank you for joining us today and join us at megcram.com.